1995 Square release Chrono Trigger, an instant classic for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. As the product of an unprecedented collaboration between the greatest minds in the RPG industry, the game has received critical acclaim and is considered one of the best titles in the entire genre. In addition, many recognize it as one of the greatest games the SNES had to offer. Chrono Trigger featured amazing characters, incredible combat mechanics, and a mind-blowing score of music. Perhaps the most defining aspect of the game, however, was its underlying story. In this video, I'll give a complete, concise, chronological storyline explanation for the entirety of the game. In this pursuit, I'll be using footage from the game's original SNES release. Because of the ramifications of branching storylines and time travel, I'll be providing the most common and logical story the game presents. Whenever possible, I'll also be using official information and artwork to convey the tale. For the purposes of this video, I will be covering two timelines. The first, the default timeline, is the one that unfolds if Chrono and his friends had never embarked upon their time-traveling adventure. The second, the Chrono timeline, is the one that plays out during the course of the game's events, where time travel impacts virtually everything. Now, let's dive into the story, beginning with the default timeline. In the year 65 million BC, Earth is inhabited by humans, reptites, and news. In this age, the humans and reptites remained in constant strife. The chief of the human clan is a woman named Isla, who resides in Ioka Village. At some point prior to 65 million BC, Isla acquired a piece of Dreamstone, a red rock with magical properties. The Reptites, an evolved, intelligent race of reptiles, are led by Azala. As the humans and reptites battle each other for control of the planet, creatures called news keep to themselves and stay out of the conflict. At some point, a giant alien life form spiraled through space. Believing the alien is a red star in the sky, the humans refer to it as Lavos. In their primitive language, La means fire and Vos means big. One day, Lavos crashed into the surface of the Earth, completely destroying the Tyranno Lair, the homeland of the reptites. As a result of the calamity, the entire reptite species goes extinct. With the gash in the planet, Lavos buries deep within the Earth. Inside the Earth's core, he intends to siphon all the energy from the planet and produce offspring. These spawns of Lavos would then continue the process, traveling to other planets to deplete their resources. Despite the arrival of Lavos, the human civilization survives. However, an ice age grips the planet. With the passage of millions of years, humanity develops advanced technology and discovers magic. At some point before 12,000 BC, the world enters into an enlightened age. Eventually, the humans of antiquity use their penchant for magic to develop a kingdom named Zeal. With the help of a mystical object called the Sunstone, a powerful source of elemental energy, the humans raise Zeal off the ground and into the sky. Now afloat, the kingdom of Zeal is a prosperous, magical kingdom. It is a bustling center of culture, technology, and scholarship. Even still, those who were incapable of using magic, the earthbound ones, were left behind on the surface to live in caves. In comparison to those in Zeal, the earthbound ones are poor and dirty and are treated as slaves. Because the giant kingdom overshadows the surface, the earthbound ones endure cold climates and blizzards. By 12,000 BC, the kingdom is ruled by Queen Zeal. Reigning from Zeal Palace, she is a cruel and uncaring leader. Apathetic to the plight of her people, she develops an obsession for achieving immortality through the power of Lavos. The queen has two children, Shala and Janus. Shala is the kind-hearted, beautiful princess of Zeal and possesses magical power. At some point, she was given a pendant made of dreamstone which adorns her neck. Janus is a young child that is gloomy, cold, and introverted. Nevertheless, he is also gifted with magical talents particularly the power of prophecy. Janus's only friend is his pet cat, Alphador, who follows him everywhere. Three famous sages also reside in the kingdom of Zeal. Melchior, the guru of life, Gaspar, the guru of time, and Balthazar, the guru of reason. Melchior, the guru of life, is put to work on a giant mechanical device called the Mammon Machine. To fuel her ambition, Queen Zeal hopes the mechanism will allow her to achieve immortality by harvesting the energy of Lavos. However, fearing the destructive potential of the Mammon machine, 
Melchior also begins to craft a sword out of Dreamstone, the Masamune, with the power to destroy it. Gaspar, the Guru of Time, works to create the Chrono Trigger, a magical egg-like item with the power of revival. Balthazar, the Guru of Reason, constructs the Blackbird, a giant flying fortress commanded by Dalton, one of Queen Zeal's assistants. Over time, Queen Zeal uses her authority to force the Earthbound Ones to build the Ocean Palace, where she plans to move the Mammon Machine. The three gurus implore the queen not to activate the machine, warning that it will open dimensional vortexes beyond human control, but she refuses to listen. After the machine is activated, Lavos is awakened. Breaking through the Earth's surface, he unleashes his power upon the world. Lavos hurls gigantic beams through the landmass of Zeal, destroying the kingdom and forcing its remnants to fall from the sky. After the calamitous destruction, the queen, the three gurus, Shala, and Janus are greeted by Lavos. Lavos opens portals underneath each of the three gurus. They are all taken by surprise and sucked into different ages. Melchior, the guru of life, is brought to Medina village around 1000 AD. Melchior builds a cabin south of Medina where he becomes a weaponsmith. Balthazar, the guru of reason, is sent to a period close to 2300 AD after the world has been destroyed by Lavos. Once he is there, he begins work on a machine that can traverse time, the Epoch. Gaspar, the Guru of Time, ends up in a place called the End of Time, an area devoid of life that exists outside of the traditional flow of time. Janus, who snuck into the Ocean Palace just as the disaster occurred, is drawn into a gate as well, and is brought to some point before 600 AD. After watching his entire world collapse, he is greeted in Truce Canyon by a creature named Ozzy. Back in antiquity, Queen Zeal and Shala stand before Lavos. Nevertheless, in this timeline, their fate is unknown. As pieces of Zeal fall into the sea, a giant tidal wave crashes into the coast. At some point, Shala's magical pendant is found by survivors and is passed down through many generations. In this post-cataclysmic world, humanity is set back thousands of years. The few survivors of Zeal must now live with the remaining Earthbound Ones and begin to rebuild civilization. With the passage of thousands of years, the Kingdom of Guardia is established and humanity enters into the Middle Ages. By 600 AD, Guardia is ruled by King Guardia and Queen Leen. The Queen wears an ancient heirloom around her neck, the same magical pendant that once belonged to Shala. After being taken in and groomed by Ozzy, Magus grows older and becomes a powerful sorcerer and leader of the Mystics. With the help of their acolytes, Ozzy and Magus build the Fiend Lord's Keep, a home of 100 monsters. Magus gains immense magical power, develops a cult of personality, and is treated as a god by his mystic underlings. From their castle, the Mystics wage war against the Kingdom of Guardia in a struggle called the Mystic War. Magus hopes their successes will cause him to grow in power to the point that he can enact vengeance upon Lavos for the destruction he's caused to his homeland and sister. In the midst of the struggle between Guardia and Magus' forces, a knight named Cyrus gains fame and prestige in Guardia and becomes named the Knight Captain. Cyrus is viewed as the powerful, legendary hero of the kingdom. His close friend, Glenn, is younger than Cyrus and lacks the fabled warrior's experience in battle. When the two were younger, Cyrus came to Glenn's aid when he was bullied and gives him encouragement. As they grow older, Cyrus urged Glenn to join the Knights of Guardia, recognizing his skill with the sword. However, Glenn declines because he believes he does not have the nerve it takes to be a knight. During the Mystic War, Glenn accompanied Cyrus on several adventures, including one wherein the two chased the Frog King through Guardia Forest to retrieve the Hero Medal a legendary accessory held by the one destined to wield the Masa Mune. In 590 AD, Cyrus abruptly embarked upon a quest to recover the Masa Mune, the legendary sword of mystical power, to defeat Magus. He informs King Guardia XI of his decision and brings Glenn with him. After braving the journey and finding the Masa Mune, Cyrus and Glenn attempt to leave Denodoro Mountain, where they are confronted by Magus and Ozzy. Failing to strike Magus, Cyrus is instead hit with the sorcerer's magical power and killed in front of Glenn's eyes as he warns his friend to flee and protect the queen. Instead of subjecting Glenn to the same fate as Cyrus, Magus hurls a bolt of lightning at him, flinging him off the cliff and 
turning him into a frog-like creature called Frog. The Masamune is split into two parts. Frog retrieves the hero medal and one half of the legendary sword, storing it in his secret home in the Cursed Woods. The other half finds its way back into Denodoro Mountain, where it is guarded by two brothers named Masa and Mune, both of whom originally lived in Zeal. Frog blames himself for the tragedy and wallows in despair over the loss of his close friend. However, he also takes the opportunity to enhance his skills in combat. He becomes a talented swordsman and vows to protect Queen Lean and avenge Cyrus. Entrenched inside the Fiend Lord's Keep, Magus successfully completes a summoning spell that beckons Lavos. In this timeline, Magus is defeated by the alien's immense power, and the Fiend Lord's Keep and all of its minions are eradicated. The few surviving mystics founded the town of Medina, and the mystic war was ended. Several centuries pass. The Kingdom of Guardia remains intact, and Truce Village becomes the capital of the kingdom. Truce was likely named for the peace between the Enlightened Ones and the Earthbound Ones that survived the fall of Zeal. In this age, Chrono and Luca are born in Truce. Chrono is a swordsman and main protagonist of the story, and lives with his mother. His best friend, Luca, is a brilliant inventor and daughter to Tobin. Several years before 1000 AD, Luca's mother, Lara, suffered a tragic accident that left her unable to walk. Luca uses various guns in battle. The kingdom is ruled by King Guardia 33, and his daughter is Princess Nadia. Constrained by her royal responsibilities, Nadia prefers to dress as a commoner and goes by the name Marl. In combat, she is skilled with a bow. In the year 1000 AD, the kingdom holds the Millennial Fair, a celebration to commemorate 1,000 years since the founding of Guardia. The fair features various games, races, and interesting personalities. Melchior, the guru of life from Zeal, sells his weapons at the fair. Luca and Tobin use the occasion to showcase their invention, the Telepod, a teleportation device that sends individuals from one station to another. Throughout this age, Lavos continues to feast upon the Earth's energy below the surface, and most people are completely unaware of his existence. The only ones who suggest otherwise are the inhabitants of Medina, descendants of the mystics, who allege that Lavos will eventually come and destroy the world. Many centuries pass and humans make technological advancements and create societies within domes. In this age, an advanced central computer called Mother Brain links all domes and factories together. By 1999 AD, Lavos has finally harvested enough energy from the Earth to bring his plan to fruition. After rising to the surface, he shoots beams of fire that fall to the Earth in a rain of destruction. The cataclysm sends humanity to the cusp of extinction, and the event becomes known as the Day of Lavos. Lavos then begins to reproduce at the top of Death Peak. Eventually, he will create spawns that seek out other planets to continue the process. By 2300 AD, the few surviving humans are hungry and poor, and forced to live in desolate conditions. Also, humanity has lost hope for the future. In this age, Balthazar continues to work on the Epoch, believing that one day adventurers strong enough will find it and use it to rectify the misfortunes that left the world in such a condition. Also in this time frame, Mother Brain has created an army of robots with the intention of wiping out the remaining humans. Among them is Prometheus, an inquisitive and powerful robot that was built in the Genodome, one of Mother Brain's factories. Unlike the other robots, however, Prometheus is compassionate toward the humans and their plight. Along with his robot girlfriend Atropos XR, he works to prevent Mother Brain from reprogramming robots to destroy humans. Both Prometheus and Atropos XR assist the remaining humans and try to obstruct the aims of Mother Brain. Unfortunately, in this timeline, Mother Brain deactivates Prometheus for having sympathy with the humans. The supercomputer also succeeds in eliminating the rest of humanity, and Lavos remains on the Earth forever. And that's the default timeline, the one that transpires if Chrono and Marl were never thrown back in time. Now, let's cover the Chrono Timeline, the series of events that unfold during a regular playthrough of the game, where time-traveling adventures change the way in which events play out. In the year 1000 AD, Chrono is awakened by his mother in the town of Truce. She tells him to enjoy the Millennial Fair, a jubilant celebration commemorating the establishment of the Kingdom of Guardia. She also reminds him to visit his friend, Luca, who is showcasing an invention there. 
At the fair, Chrono runs into Melchior, a traveling swordsman that offers his wares. He says he lives in the continent to the east, and tells Chrono to come see him sometime. Afterward, Chrono heads to Lean's Bell, where he bumps into a young woman. In the process, she drops her pendant. Chrono helps her up and returns the pendant to her. After thanking Chrono, the young woman says her name is Marl. She asks Chrono to bring her around the fair, and he agrees. Eventually, Chrono and Marl make their way to Luca and Tobin, who are showing off the telepod device. Chrono tries out the device, and the machine properly sends him from one platform to the other. Marl responds with excitement, wishing to give it a try. When she does so, the pendant she wears, which was originally Shala's, shines mysteriously. Suddenly, a giant portal opens up, and Marl is sucked inside. The stunned crowd disperses, and Marl's pendant drops to the ground. Luca urges Chrono to follow her. He does so, picking up the pendant and stepping onto the telepod. Luca and Tobin then fire the machine up again. Suddenly, the portal appears once again, and Chrono is sent inside. Chrono arrives in an area where he is ambushed by enemies. He follows a trail down the mountain, and discovers a world that is quite a bit unlike his own. In truce, he discovers it is the year 600 AD, and that the Kingdom of Guardia is involved in a war with the Mystics. Chrono ventures to Guardia Castle, where he's greeted by a familiar-looking queen. Believing in his Marl, he proceeds inside. When he reaches the queen's room, he sees her again, and the queen admits to be Marl. Just as she thanks Chrono for coming to rescue her, she panics and suddenly disappears. As Chrono leaves the castle, he finds Luca, who ventured through the gate to reach the same time frame. She explains that Marl is actually Princess Nadia of Guardia, and that Queen Lean of 600 AD is one of her ancestors. According to Luca, the people of Guardia must have mistaken Marl for the queen of their time due to her resemblance. Because Queen Lean has been kidnapped and endangered in the Middle Ages, Marl has simply ceased to exist. To rectify this and save Marl, Chrono and Luca must also save Queen Lean from her current predicament. Chrono and Luca head west to the cathedral where they find some nuns. After talking to the nun by the organ, a hairpin from Guardia's royal crest appears on the ground. Suddenly, the nuns encircle Chrono and Luca and transform into Naga Ets. As they are defeated, another Naga Ed appears. Suddenly, a swordsman arrives from the ceiling. He quickly dispatches the beast and introduces himself as Frog, protector of Queen Lean. Chrono and Luca join Frog in his pursuit to find and rescue her. When the organ is played, a secret door appears and the group heads inside. As they reach the end of the area, the adventurers find the real Queen Lean and the Chancellor. The Queen takes off running, and the Chancellor transforms into a monster called Yakra, his true form. After vanquishing Yakra, the team finds the real Chancellor in a treasure chest nearby. Lean thanks Frog and invites Chrono and Luca to Guardia. At the castle, the King greets the Queen, and the Chancellor explains the deeds of Yakra. He says that the Kingdom must create a criminal justice system to prevent such a scenario in the future. Frog laments his failure to protect the Queen and leaves the throne room. Back in the Queen's chamber, Marl appears again, wondering what happened. As Luca greets her as Princess Nadia, Marl realizes her true identity has been exposed. She apologizes to Chrono for misleading him, saying she only did so because she thought Chrono wouldn't have shown her around the fair otherwise. The three agree to head back to their own age, so they head out of the castle. On the way, Queen Lean admits that Marl could really be her twin. Frog professes that it was his fault that the Queen went missing, but compliments Chrono's skill as a swordsman. Heading back to Truce Canyon, the group reaches the portal that sent them to the Middle Ages. Luca reveals that she's created a gate key, which allows the team to open such gates. Marl says she would trade her royal ancestry for Luca's ingenuity. The team wonders why the gate appeared, but agree to jump inside to return to their own time. Back in 1000 AD at the Millennial Fair, Marl invites Chrono and Luca to Guardia Castle. Luca says she has some work to do and leaves, but Marl asks Chrono to escort her home. When he does so, Princess Nadia is greeted at the castle. However, the Chancellor accuses Chrono of abducting her and summons his staff to apprehend Chrono and send him to trial. The Chancellor acts as the prosecutor, while a man named Pierre serves as Chrono's lawyer. 
the Chancellor purports that Kronel kidnapped Nadia and endangered the kingdom. However, Pierre contests this and claims Kronel was only attempting to help the princess. After being presented with a series of events that transpired as Kronel and Marl met, the jurors are to determine Kronel's fate. Depending on the player's series of actions and answers to questions, Kronel will be judged guilty or not guilty. Even if a not guilty verdict is returned, it is determined that Krono will be thrown into solitary confinement. The Chancellor takes Krono to Guardia Prison, where he tells the Jailer that he is to be executed in three days, regardless of the verdict. After the guards knock Krono out, he awakens in a cell, and rattles the bars to get their attention. The guard goes into his cell, knocking him out again, but Krono fights back after the guard has turned his back. Climbing the tower walls and fighting his way through the prison, Krono defeats several guards and releases a man named Fritz, the son of a store owner in Truce, from the guillotine. When Krono reaches the entrance, the supervisor flees in terror and Luca comes to save the day. Exiting across the bridge, they encounter the Dragon Tank, a strong mechanical foe. After he is defeated, the Chancellor arrives with his minions in an attempt to fix it, but the machine explodes. The Chancellor and his underlings nearly fall into the pit left by the machine and form a bridge for Krono and Luca to escape. As they make their way out of the castle, Marl shows up and demands that the castle servants show respect to Krono and Luca. Just then, the Chancellor arrives along with King Guardia 33, who tells his daughter that the throne comes before her wishes. Marl rebels, refusing to listen to her father. She changes back into her casual attire and takes Krono and Luca out of the castle. Nonetheless, the Chancellor orders the servants to follow them. They chase them down to a dead end in Guardia Forest, where the three find another gate. Just as the Chancellor has them cornered, the three enter the gate and disappear once more. The adventurers travel through time once again, arriving in 2300 AD, a dead and desolate world. After leaving the Bangor Dome, they make their way to Lab 16, a wasteland filled with enemies. After fighting their way through it, they reach a sewer access facility where they discover a monster named Crawley has taken over. After using a switch to help guide them through the sewer, they confront Crawley. When he is overcome, they make their way to the Keeper's Dome. Inside, they find Balthazar, who is hard at work loading a final program code into a robotic creature. Balthazar says that he misses Shala, the Princess of Zeal from ages past. He also warns Chrono and his friends not to climb Death Peak, until the right time. Finally, he asks if the party has seen the Ocean Palace and the Blackbird, both of which he has built. When the three make their way to the Aeris Dome, they encounter a large group of humans who are surprised to see anyone in such good health as Chrono and his friends. The Elder, Doan, tells the crew that the basement contains a food storage area and a computer sign. One of the men in the dome climbed down the ladder in search of food, but has not been heard from since. To assist those in the dome, Chrono and his friends descend down the ladder and into the basement. At the end of the area, the team faces Guardian, a giant robot with two helper bits. When he's defeated, Chrono and friends enter into an area where the food was stored. The man who entered before is deceased, but he is clutching seeds in his hand. The group takes them and catches a rat deeper inside to reveal the code to a secret passage. At the end, they find the info center of the dome which contains an operational computer. Hoping to use it to find a gate back to their own time, Luca fires it up. The computer points the crew to the Proto-Dome, a location to the east. Abruptly, Marl suddenly presses another button on the console. As she does so, the three view the visual record of 1999 AD the day of Lavos. In the footage, Lavos rises to the surface of the earth, unleashing his fury upon the world. Fire falls from the sky, destroying most life on the planet, and the team realizes that Lavos is the force that is destroying the world. Marl can barely come to grips with the reality that the three are in the future. However, she urges Luca and Chrono to do whatever possible to change history to prevent the catastrophe, much like they did in the Middle Ages. After the three friends agree, Luca suggests doing research on Lavos and the present by way of the gate in the Protodome. As they return to the upper level, the humans swarm the group, impressed that they made it back. Even though they found no food, Marl explains that the seeds represent hope for the future. Although they are mystified by Chrono and his friends, Don and the humans agree to plant the seeds. He 
He also gives the adventurers a bike key, allowing them to get through Lab 32 on the way to the Proto Dome. Just as they start up the jet bike at the end of Lab 32, Chrono's party is swarmed by robots, then greeted by Johnny, a cyborg racer who the robots call the man. Johnny challenges Chrono to a bike race. Chrono then starts up the bike and beats Johnny. Afterward, Johnny admits defeat and the three friends arrive at the Protodome. Inside, they find a deactivated humanoid robot. Luca inspects it closer and realizes she can repair it. After she does so, the robot is activated. He introduces himself as R66Y, but the three decide to refer to him as Robo. Robo does not recall his origins, but he knows that there were once many other humans in the Protodome. The team decides to venture to the factory to the north in order to activate the Protodome's power generator, which allows access to the gate within. In the factory, Robo overrides the security system, allowing passage inside. After solving puzzles and moving large objects out of the way, the group hits a central switch that puts the security system into emergency mode. As they flee from the corridor, Robo helps the others escape by blocking the closed doors, then slips through himself. In the next room, Robo finds some of his former friends, all R-Series robots. However, one of the robots knocks him out, claiming that he is defective and has been tainted by humans. The robots say that their mission was to eliminate all intruders and declare that Robo has betrayed them. The robots throw Robo to the ground and begin to charge at him, then dispose of him down a dumpster hatch. Chrono and Luca then face the R-Series robots. When they are defeated, the two recover their broken friend and drag him back to the Protodome. While Luca works diligently to repair him, Robo asks if the group plans to save the dying world. They answer in the affirmative and Luca completes the repairs. Robo decides he wants to join in the adventure, saying he will do whatever he can to give the planet a chance. The four go through the previously sealed door and use the gate key to enter the gate. However, instead of throwing them back to 1000 AD, they end up at the end of time, an area where time has no effect. There, they find an old man near a light post. He explains that all travelers lost to time end up there, and that recent space-time disturbances have led many to arrive at the end of time. Going forward, only three party members can use the Pillars of Light to travel to different ages, while the remainder must stay behind in the end of time. The old man also tells the adventurers to check the door behind them. Inside, they find Specchio, the shape-shifting master of war. He tells Chrono and his friends that people once abused the power of magic, and in time it could only be used by wizards. Nonetheless, he teaches them each magic of a different brand. Chrono learns lightning magic, Luca learns fire magic, and Marl learns ice magic. Robo cannot learn magic because he is a machine. The old man suggests that they head back to their own age. When they do so, they end up in Medina Village, a place founded by the ancestors of the mystics that lost a war against Guardia in the Middle Ages. The monsters there still worship Magus, the former leader of the mystics. They are under the impression that it was he who originally created Lavos to destroy humanity. To the west they stumble upon Melchior's hut, where the former guru of life resides. He tells the group to use the shortcut through the mountains to the north to get back to Truce. When they head inside, they find the Hecran cave, which is filled with monsters. At the end, they encounter Hecram himself, a giant beast that promises death to the mystic's enemies. After he is dispatched, Lucas suggests venturing to the Middle Ages to stop Magus, the supposed creator of Lavos. When they jump into the whirlpool, they are transported back to Truce. Using the gate at the fair, they are sent back to 600 AD again. There, they learn more about the Mystics' War and discover that a legendary hero has appeared to meet with the king. Because Cyrus went missing years ago, an injured soldier says that all hope now rests with a boy who found the hero medal. According to the soldier, the boy recently left to search the world for the fabled sword that can defeat Magus. To assist Guardia's forces, Chrono and friends retrieve some jerky from the chef of Guardia Castle and bring it to the forces at Xenon Bridge. There, a battle between Guardia and the forces of Magus is commencing. Running across the bridge, the party participates in the conflict. In the process, they are introduced to Ozzy, Magus's top general, who attempts to overwhelm the army with monsters. Ozzy flees to the end of the bridge, where he summons Zombor, a giant skeleton fashioned from the remnants of the defeated enemies. Chrono and friends use their abilities to vanquish the foe and are now able to cross the bridge. In 
the nearby town of Dorino, they find an adventurer named Toma, who claims to be a fabled explorer. He accepts some money from the village elder to search for the rainbow shell, a magical item to create reflective armor. They also learn that only a mystical sword called the Masa Mune can defeat Magus. They also meet a woman named Fiona. Her husband has gone off to fight in the Mystic War, so she commits herself to preserving the woods near her villa until he returns. In the cursed woods to the west, they find Frog, who lives in a hidden location. He struggles with self-confidence, wholly under the impression that he cannot be of help to the war. After professing that he is no hero, he tells Chrono and his friends to be on their way. In the town of Pori, the party discovers that it was a young boy named Tata that found the hero medal and left to the Denodoro Mountains in search of the Masa Mune. However, Chrono and his friends reach the base of the mountains and find Tata fleeing from the enemies. Nevertheless, the group continues through the mountains. Near the summit, they discover a boy near the Masa Mune. When the party reveals that they are there for the sword, he reveals himself to be Mune, one of the sword's keepers. His brother, Masa, also appears from behind the sword. The two decide to test the might of Chrono and his friends to determine if they deserve the Masa Mune. As they do so, they reveal their true forms, creatures from the Kingdom of Zeal, and engage the trio. When the two are defeated, they admit that only Cyrus had ever gotten this far. The two then combine their strengths, Masa's bravery, and Mune's knowledge, together into a single beast called Masa and Mune. After he is defeated, they agree to allow Chrono and his friends to take the blade. However, the Masa Mune appears to have been broken for ages, so the group is only able to take one half of it. The team rides the wind to leave the mountain and travels back to Tata's house, where they find the supposed hero hiding under the stairs. He admits that he found the hero medal after it was dropped by Frog, and gives it to Chrono after admitting he was never cut out to be a hero. The group heads back to Frog's home and returns the hero medal to him. Frog is still reluctant to challenge Magus as he does not possess the Masa Mune. In Frog's chest, however, they find the sword's hilt. It is engraved with letters that spell out Melchior, who now lives near Medina Village. Though Frog believes that no one can reforge the Masa Mune, Chrono and his friends decide to seek Melchior out. When they return to Melchior in 1000 AD, he is shown the broken Masa Mune. When asked why his name is engraved upon it, he confesses that it's a long story. However, he says that it might be possible to reforge the legendary sword if the group can find some Dreamstone, an ancient, magical red mineral that no longer exists. With the repair of the Masa Mune on their minds, Chrono and his friends go to the end of time, and step onto the light pillar to 65 million BC. When they arrive in prehistory, they are suddenly surrounded by reptites, reptile-like creatures. After an initial scuffle, a frenzied woman jumps out to help them, and comments on the strength of the group. She introduces herself as Isla, the chief of the nearby human settlement. Chrono's friends explain that they are from the future, but Isla doesn't seem to understand. Nonetheless, she invites the party to her nearby village of Ioka, where she says they will eat and celebrate. When Lucas says they are looking for Dreamstone, she implies that it can be found in Ioka. After arriving there, Isla brings the group to a tribal party. Following a brief dance session, Isla explains that the humans of Ioka and Laruba are engaged in a war with the Reptites, who are led by Azala. She then shows Chrono the Dreamstone, which she possesses as the strongest human of her village. If Chrono can beat her in a race to drink the most Jurassic pork soup, Isla says she will hand it over. After consuming so much soup, Chrono and his friends wake up the next day with no sign of Isla. Instead, there are reptite footprints all around the party grounds, and Luca's gate key has been stolen. Without it, the group is stuck in the ancient world. They find Isla sleeping in her hut, but wake her to alert her to the situation. She is sure that the reptites took the key and offers to join the party to retrieve it. With Isla in the party, the group ventures to the forest maze where they find her friend Kino. Kino admits to taking the gate key to win the esteem of Isla and apologizes. However, he says that the key was later stolen by the reptites who brought it through the trees. Isla sends Kino back to the village and the group follows the tracks through the forest maze. The trail leads into the reptite lair where the group eventually finds Azala, the leader of the reptites. As he holds the gate key, he wonders how humans could have created such an invention. Chrono and his friends explain the function of the key, but Azala calls them liars. He then summons Nisbel, a giant dinosaur-like beast, to challenge the party. After the trio defeat him, 
Azala coughs up the gate key, but declares that the Reptites will still rule the world. Returning to the village, the three thank Isla, and Kino apologizes again. They take the gate back to 1000 AD and bring the Dreamstone back to Melchior. Although he's shocked that they were able to find the mineral, he agrees to reforge the Masamune. In his basement, Luca works on the Dreamstone while Melchior shapes the sword. When it is finished, Luca hoists it into the air. Melchior comments on the considerable power of the blade, saying it may either save or destroy life. The group travels back to 600 AD and hands the legendary sword to Frog. Although he is absolutely stunned to see the recrafted Masamune, Frog is still reluctant to use it. As he ponders doing so during the night, he reflects upon his past, where he and Cyrus ventured to the Denodoro Mountains to find the blade ten years ago. He relives the memory of Cyrus' death at the hands of Magus, and recalls his inability to challenge the sorcerer. The next morning, he asks himself whether he can still avenge his dear friend. After Chrono and his friends wake up, Frog agrees to join the team and use the sword to confront Magus. As they travel toward the Fiend Lord's Keep, they head through the Magic Cave, where Glenn remembers his friendship with Cyrus once again. As they grew older, Cyrus thought Glenn should join the Knights of Guardia because of his skill as a swordsman, but he was always hesitant to do so. After remembering the cursed spell that turned him into a frog, he now possesses a newfound confidence. Pulling the Masamune out of the ground, he holds the sword up, and the blade unleashes a magical beam. Frog uses the beam to cut through the mountains, splitting them in half, and creating a path through the cave. As they approach the Fiend Lord's Keep, the party is taken by its enormity. As they enter into the gate, they investigate both wings of the area. Afterward, they are greeted by Ozzy in the foyer, who taunts Frog. Ozzy says that Magus is busy, and that the adventurers will have to deal with Slash, Flea, and all 100 monsters of the castle. In the left wing, they discover Slash, a powerful swordsman that mocks Glenn and his former friend Cyrus. Chrono and his friends use their techniques to defeat him, and as he fades away, he says he has no regrets. In the right wing, the team meets Flea, a cross-dressing magician who also derides Frog and his friends. The three use their powers to overcome the wizard, and Flea calls out to Magus as he fades away. Further inside, Ozzy is found yet again. The party chases him through multiple areas and tracks him down to the end of the castle. There, Ozzy finally challenges them in battle after warning that Lavos will arrive. To defeat Ozzy, the party attacks the pulleys nearby, creating a hole underneath Ozzy's barrier. Ozzy falls down through the hole, opening the way to Magus. As they approach the inner sanctum, Magus is reciting a spell, intending to summon Lavos so that he can seek vengeance for the destruction the alien caused to his sister and the kingdom of Zeal. Just at that moment, Chrono and his friends arrive to interrupt him. The sorcerer then reveals himself and recognizes Frog. Referring to the Masamune, Frog says he has something for Magus. Realizing this, Magus declares that the Black Wind begins to blow, and turns to face the group. The foe unleashes immensely powerful magical attacks upon the adventurers. However, he is weakened by the Masamune and eventually overwhelmed by the group. Just as Magus admits defeat, however, the earth shakes and Lavos begins to awaken. Magus says that rather than creating Lavos, he was simply casting a spell to summon him from his slumber within the earth. As Chrono and his friends realize that Lavos was from an earlier period, a gigantic void appears in the middle of the room. The gate engulfs everyone, including Magus himself. The gate sends Magus back to the Kingdom of Zeal in 12,000 BC, bringing him back to his origins. There, he uses the knowledge of his past to pose as a prophet, and gains favor with Queen Zeal. Chrono dreams that Marl wakes him up at his home in Truce and speaks as if the two are married. However, he actually awakens with his friends in 65 million BC in Ioka Village. Isla says she found the three wounded in the Mystic Mountains and carried them back. Luca remembers that Magus said Lavos was born in the distant past, and implies that this age may be the key to stopping him. Chrono and his friends discover that Laruba has been destroyed by Reptites, who followed Isla after she helped return the Gate Key. The old man blames Isla, but she says she intends to travel to the Tyranno Lair to get revenge on the Reptites. In order to do so, she will use Dactyl, a flying dinosaur, to travel over the terrain. Chrono and his friends follow Isla to the Dactyl Nest and volunteer to help her challenge the Reptites. With the newfound transportation of flight, they land at the Tyranno Lair and head inside. They free Kino from imprisonment and find Azala on the throne. 
He says today will determine whether the humans or reptites will rule the world. He flees outside and commands the red star, Lavos, to stain the earth red. The party then clashes with Azala and the Black Tyranno. When they are defeated, Azala says that fire will fall from the sky and an ice age will set in. Isla attempts to convince Azala to escape with them, but he refuses. As the group escapes on Dactyl, Lavos falls from the sky, striking the earth, destroying the Tyranno lair, and wiping out the reptites entirely. Krono and his friends find a gate directly where Lavos fell. As they enter, they find themselves in 12,000 BC, where an ice age grips the surface. They use the nearby skyway to lift themselves to the Kingdom of Zeal, an advanced world of magic, science, and technology. In Enhasa, the party meets Janus, the younger child of Queen Zeal. He tells Krono and his friends that one of them will shortly perish. When asked for an explanation, he simply walks away. Zeal's three famous gurus have played a large role in recent events. Because the people of this age have discovered the existence of Lavos, Melchior built the Mammon Machine, a giant device to harness the alien's power for the queen. However, the contraption only activates by way of Shala's magical pendant. Because Melchior opposed the queen's desire to use the Mammon Machine for such a purpose, he was banished to the Mountain of Woe. Belthazar created the Blackbird, a giant flying fortress now under the command of Dalton, and the Ocean Palace, an underwater fortress. Gaspar, the last of the three gurus, has been working on a device called the Chrono Trigger, but he and Belthazar have gone missing as well. Rather than the three gurus, the queen has recently come under the influence of Magus, who has been posing as a cloaked prophet after being sucked into the void in the Fiend Lord's Keep. After investigating, Krono and his friends learn that the Queen plans to move the Mammon Machine to the Ocean Palace, where it can be used to extract the energy of Lavos. At Zeal Palace, the party sees Janus again, this time with his sister, Shala. The two sense the Black Wind howling, but Shala reassures Janus and gives him a magical amulet to protect him. Janus laments that the personality of their mother, Queen Zeal, has recently shifted. Right then, an attendant comes into the room and says Shala's presence is needed at the Ocean Palace. However, the group discovers that Marl's pendant looks exactly like Shala's. They take it to the Mammon Machine, which charges the pendant with magical energy. Afterward, they bring it to the sealed door Shala entered through. This time, the door opens through the magical force of Marl's pendant. Within the chamber, they find Queen Zeal, Shala, Prophet, and Dalton. The Queen asks Chrono and his friends who they are. Before they can respond, however, the Prophet says they are three evildoers he warned about, and would come to the kingdom and cause trouble. Dalton summons a monstrous foe, Golem, to fight the group. They use their techniques to destroy him, but Dalton seals Chrono and his friends in a magical force field, and they are taken captive. While in prison, Janus ridicules the adventurers, but Shala decides to rescue them because she thinks they will be able to save the banished gurus. As she unlocks the force field, she helps them escape from the palace and tells them to seek out Melchior at the Mountain of Woe. Just then, the Prophet catches them in the act and threatens Krono and his friends. After an argument, he agrees to spare their lives, but only if Shala cooperates with his plan. He then follows them to the gate through which they entered the era. The Prophet orders Shala to seal the gate shut after he throws them back into the void. She is hesitant, but eventually does so, and the gate is locked by Shala's magic. While pondering what to do next, Luca comments that the crest on Zeal's doors have been seen in other periods. One of them is in the Keeper's Dome in the future, where Belthazar was working to load program into a creature. When they return there through the end of time, they find Belthazar is no longer in the Keeper's Dome. Instead is the strange creature who says that the Professor's programming served as his eulogy. Belthazar has passed away, but has left a trail of messages for those who are able to go through the sealed door. With Marl's pendant, the party heads through the magical entrance. The messages indicate that Belthazar was once Zeal's guru of reason, and that a great disaster somehow threw him into this time frame. Additional notes explain that after Lavos destroyed the world, he went to Death Peak, where he began the reproduction process. Ever since he was stranded in the future, Belthazar worked to construct his ultimate creation, a machine that can be used to traverse through time. He decided to leave it to any of those brave enough to make it to this point. Krono and his friends open the door and approach the Epoch, the Wings of Time. They now have the ability to toggle between periods without gates. With the Epoch, the team is able to travel back to 12,000 BC once again, bypassing Shala's seal. There, they find Al Gedi, a settlement of the Earthbound Ones, humans who are unable to use magic and remain on the surface as the slaves of Zeal. 
They learn that Shala is well liked there for her charity, and that the Mountain of Woe is beyond the beast's nest. The group fights their way through it, then climbs the chain to the Mountain of Woe. At the end of the cliff, they find Melchior, the Guru of Life, encased in ice. As they approach, however, they are challenged by Giga Gaia. After using their abilities to slay him, Melchior is released from his icy prison. The Guru wonders why the adventurers seem to know him already. He also asks about the Ocean Palace, and the group informs him that the Queen plans to bring the Mammon Machine there. As the Earthbound Ones panic, the chain to the mountain breaks and the landmass crumbles. Back in Al Gedi, Melchior warns that the proximity of the Mammon Machine to the center of the Earth will awaken Lavos. As he does so, Shala and Janus suddenly enter the room. Shala says she refuses to help her mother activate the Mammon Machine, and urges Krono and his friends to go to the Ocean Palace to obstruct the Queen. Dalton then appears, uses his magic to throw Melchior to the side, and forces Shala to go to the Ocean Palace with him. After they are gone, Chrono volunteers to challenge the Queen, and Melchior gives him the Ruby Knife, a weapon made of Dreamstone that can destroy the Mammon Machine. The group uses the Skyway to return to Zeal Palace. There, the party finds Dalton complaining that he's been put on guard duty while the Prophet has been taken to the Ocean Palace. The adventurers rout him with their own powers, and he disappears through a gate. Krona and his friends use the same gate, which transports them to the Ocean Palace. As they fight their way through, the Queen forces Shala to raise the power of the Mammon Machine. As the Prophet looks on, she reluctantly does so as the Queen remains obsessed with the power of Lavos. In the palace, Masa says the Dreamstone was used to create a magic pendant and knife, and encourages the group to stop the Queen. As the power of Lavos is harvested by the Mammon Machine, the Queen orders Shala to continue her attention to the task. As they reach the end of the palace, Krono and his friends encounter Dalton again, who summons the Golem Twins to delay them. After they are vanquished, Dalton senses Lavos' energy and teleports out. As the team reaches the chamber with a Mammon machine, Luca threatens to deactivate the device and save Shala. However, the Queen's power magically binds Shala to the ground. Krono quickly produces the red knife that was given by Melchior and throws it into the Mammon machine. As it absorbs the immense power, the machine changes the knife into a sword, the Masamune. After an enormous roar, Lavos then appears, awakened from his slumber within the earth. His incredible power overwhelms Krono and his friends, and they fall to the ground. At that point, the Prophet throws off his cloak, revealing himself to be Magus. After declaring his intention to destroy Lavos to avenge the destruction he has caused, the Queen appears and jumps on the back of Lavos, declaring that the Prophet is no match. Lavos uses magic energy to drain the powers of Magus, but for a moment the sorcerer shakes it off and charges at the beast's eye. However, Lavos absorbs the strike and throws Magus to the ground. As the queen boasts of her forthcoming eternal life with Lavos, Chrono awakens. Deciding to help Shala, Chrono stands up to the giant alien. Lavos then focuses a concentrated magical beam upon Chrono, causing his body to completely disintegrate. As Magus laments that Lavos cannot be beaten, Shala uses the last of her pendant's power to save Krono's friends. Lavos then rises from the Ocean Palace to the surface of the Earth, and unleashes his flurry of fire into the sky. His magical beams pierce Zeal, cutting the continent apart. As Zeal explodes, the entire kingdom falls into the sea, and a giant tidal wave appears in the distance. Crashing into the coast, it kills many of the Earthbound ones as well. The group awakens without Chrono on the only island of refuge that remains in antiquity. The Epoch survived the disaster, but Mara weeps that Chrono is gone. The party also learns that Melchior was sucked into a black portal while trying to save Janus, and Shala's fate is unknown. An old man found Marl's pendant on her shoulder and returns it to her. At the ruinous commons, the Enlightened Ones and Earthbound Ones are now forced to live together. As the adventurers talk to the Elder, Dalton appears and declares himself king of his newly found kingdom of Dalton. Dalton has found and stolen the Epoch and says it is just like the one Balthazar was building. He then uses his magic to incapacitate the party. The group awakens without their items and weapons. They soon realize they are on the Blackbird, the giant flying fortress that survived the fall of Zeal. Inside, they recover their items and fight their way to the top of the Blackbird. After defeating the Golem boss, Dalton equips the Epoch with a pair of wings in order to enable it to fly. From the Blackbird, Chrono's friends jump off the wings and land on the Epoch to confront Dalton. After he is beaten, they retake control of the Epoch. They also use the new controls Dalton installed, inadvertently firing lasers at the Blackbird. 
the Blackbird explodes due to the sheer power of the weapons and crashes to the ground. Now with the flying time machine, they decide it's time to focus on reviving Chrono. Before they do so though, they head to the North Cape where Magus magically appears. Before Frog can seek vengeance, Magus bemoans the fall of his homeland. Gone is the kingdom of Zeal, he says, and all the dreams and ambitions of its people. Revealing that he was Janus, Magus reflects upon his past. Under the original timeline, Janus snuck into the Mammon Machine's chamber. When Lavos appeared, the alien sent Zeal's three gurus, Melchior, Gasper, and Balthazar, to different ages. In addition, Janus was sucked into a portal as well. After watching the madness unfold, Janus appeared in the Middle Ages where he was discovered by Ozzy. Magus explains that ever since he was sent through the time portal, he aspired to even the score with Lavos. Still hoping to do so, he agrees to join the party. Frog is reluctant to allow it, but admits that slaying Magus will neither return Chrono nor Cyrus. Magus suggests seeking the help of Gaspar, the Guru of Time, to find a method to bring Chrono back. Now imbued with the power of Lavos, Queen Zeal raises the Ocean Palace into the sky. It becomes the Black Omen, a flying temple of immense power. She then waits millennia for Lavos to return and destroy the world. At the end of time, the old man gives the group the Chrono Trigger, an egg-shaped item with the power to halt time. He also finally admits he is Gaspar, Zeal's guru of time. In the future, Balthazar's strange creature directs the party to Death Peak, where life restoration is possible. However, he says that the group needs to find a clone of Chrono for the process to work. To do so, they seek out Norstein Beckler at the Millennial Fair. After winning an imitation game, they are awarded the clone of Chrono. When they pick it up at Chrono's house, they tell Chrono's mother that her son is doing fine. With the assistance of Balthazar's helper devices, the team climbs their way through Death Peak, defeating several spawns of Lavos created through the reproduction process. At the summit, they find a lone tree. Chrono's friends hold up the Chrono Trigger, and Marl's pendant begins to react. The Chrono Trigger elevates into the air and shatters. As an eclipse occurs, the group finds themselves at the moment of Chrono's death at the hands of Lavos. The party takes the opportunity to swap Chrono for the clone. As the scene fades back to Death Peak, the tree is illuminated with magical power and Chrono is saved. His friends celebrate the occasion and welcome him back with open arms. With Chrono back in the fold, several side ventures now become available. In 2300 AD, the group finds the Sun Palace in the southwest portion of the map. Inside, they find the Son of Sun. After defeating it, it flees deeper into the palace and turns into the Moonstone. Chrono and his friends take the rock back to 65 million BC and place it in the Sun Keep. However, in 1000 AD, it is missing from the keep. Tracking it down, they find a house in Pore that shines with the stone's energy. Inside is the mayor of Pore, who has stolen it but denies everything. To reverse the inclinations of his ancestors, the group brings some jerky back to the house in 600 AD, where a woman appreciates the party's generosity. This changes the future such that the mayor in 1000 AD will now hand over the Moonstone to Chrono and his friends. They return it to the Sun Keep again and retrieve it in 2300 AD. Luca transforms the charged Sunstone into a powerful weapon. In 12,000 BC, the team tells a woman in the commons to plant a sapling. They then travel to 600 AD, where Fiona is attempting to protect her forest from monsters that have threatened it. The group drops into a whirlpool of quicksand where they find and defeat Reptonite, a giant skeleton. However, the forest is saved only temporarily, and Robo agrees to stay behind in the Middle Ages to replant it. When the party goes forward 400 years to the present, the forest is replanted but Robo has been decommissioned and kept in a shrine in the center of the forest. He rejoins the party, happily announcing that the forest has been successfully saved. That night, as Luca fixes Robo, the team also wonders whether it was Lavos that created the gates. Robo suspects that a greater power wishes for them to experience the events they have witnessed. After falling asleep, Luca awakens to find a nearby gate, which sends her to 990 AD before her mother lost the use of her legs. There, she is able to correctly input the password of the contraption, stopping it from injuring Lara. When she returns, Robo gives her a gift, a preserved piece of amber made from the sap of a tree in his forest. Back in 600 AD, Toma has finally gotten a lead on the rainbow shell. He gives Chrono Toma's pop, telling him to pour it over his gravestone if he does not return. When the party returns to the present and finds his gravestone, they do so. 
Suddenly, the ghost of the legendary adventurer appears and says that the rainbow shell is in a cave called the Giant's Claw. There, the group fights through the enemies in the cave and find the rainbow shell, but it is too heavy to lift. Back at Guardia Castle, the king agrees to bring it back to Guardia to keep it safe. In 1000 AD, the king has been put on trial by the Chancellor, who claims that he has sold the rainbow shell, one of Guardia's heirlooms. Fighting their way through the treasury, Chrono and his friends find the rainbow shell in a note from Marl's deceased mother. Marl bursts through the court and shows the Chancellor a piece of the rainbow shell, proving the king hadn't sold it. The Chancellor of this time turns into Yakra 13, declaring he will avenge his ancestor's death. However, Chrono and his friends make quick work of him. Afterward, Marl and her father make amends with each other. The crew opens a chest to reveal the real Chancellor, and goes back into the treasury where Melchior offers to craft legendary items from the rainbow shell. In the present, the party finds the ghost of Cyrus haunting the northern ruins. His power overwhelms Crone on his friends, and he calls out for Glenn. After retrieving some tools in the Middle Ages, Chrono recruits an excavator to clear out the area. Inside is the grave of Cyrus. Frog greets his departed friend and promises to continue honoring his promise. Suddenly, the ghost of Cyrus appears. Rather than think ill of Glenn, he compliments his skill and dedication. As he departs, he again tells Glenn to look after Queen Lean. In that moment, the Masa Mune begins to take on a life of its own. Masa and Mune appear, combining their powers once again to empower the legendary blade. As it falls back into Frog's hands, the sword flows with strength, and the true identity of the Masa Mune is revealed. With Robo, the party travels to the Genodome in 2300 AD. Inside, the computer system refers to Robo as Prometheus and condemns him for defiling the place with humans. Deeper inside, they encounter Atropos XR, Robo's old android girlfriend. Now reprogrammed by Mother Brain, she tells Robo that his original purpose was to study the remaining humans so that they could be more easily destroyed. Atropos XR challenges Robo, who is reluctant to fight her. When she's defeated, her old memories are restored. She apologizes for fighting and gives Robo her ribbon. She then fades away. They next encounter Mother Brain herself, who has taken over the computer system and organized a robot revolution to destroy all humans. After declaring that she will reprogram Prometheus, Robo sides with his friends, unwilling to lose anything precious to him. The party uses their talents to defeat the supercomputer, and Robo gains his ultimate weapons. The computer system is now shut down for good. In the present, the people of Medina are now worshipping Ozzy. In the Middle Ages, the group realizes that this is because Ozzy has taken over the Fiend Lord's Keep after the disappearance of Magus. When the sorcerer returns, however, Ozzy accuses him of deserting the mystics and serving the humans. As he asks why Magus did so, Ozzy flees into the castle. In the process of tracking him down, they face Flea again in a strengthened form. They also encounter a more powerful Slash and defeat him as well. They finally catch up with Ozzy, who is joined with Slash and Flea. Ozzy boasts that their special items make them invincible. However, the three are beaten by the strength of Chrono and his friends. Ozzy flees for the last time into a back room and encases himself in a barrier. He surprises the group by throwing them down a hole, but when they return, the cat walks into the room and flicks a switch, sending Ozzy to his doom through another pit. In the present, the inhabitants of Medina no longer worship Magus or Ozzy. Chrono and his friends then venture to the Black Omen, which exists in all periods. Bursting their way through the entry, they find Queen Zeal, who has achieved an immortal state. She proceeds to mock the adventurers and warns that Lavos will reign with limitless power. She then summons a powerful monster to attack the party and escapes. After fighting their way through the Black Omen, they eventually reach the Queen again. After forecasting a depressing future for humanity, she attacks the group. After she is overcome by the power of Chrono and his friends, she then summons the Mammon Machine to attack the adventurers. After the device is destroyed, the Queen appears once more at the top of the Black Omen. She ridicules the party again, reiterating her intention to live with Lavos forever. Magus calls her a foolish woman who was duped by the power of Lavos and promises to put an end to her. She then takes a superhuman form and attacks the party. When she is finally overpowered, she beckons Lavos, who uses his magical force to swallow and destroy the Black Omen. In its place, the giant beast rises to the surface of the ocean and attacks Chrono and his friends. Lavos assumes the same powers as the bosses the party has faced throughout time, but they eventually destroy the alien's eye. The 
the team enters into the shell where they find Lavos' true form. He unleashes a variety of powerful attacks, but Krono and his friends are able to defeat him. When Lavos is destroyed, Lavos' core appears. The group then realizes that the alien's goal was to use the genetic code of all living beings to achieve the ultimate in evolution. With their own powerful techniques, the party is able to defeat him, and Lavos roars loudly as he fades away. Afterward, Krono wakes up in his bed where a soldier of Guardia tells him that his stay of execution has been cancelled and that his sentence will be carried out. When he gets to Guardia Castle, the king asks Krono where he took his daughter. Just then, Marl shows up to explain that Krono is innocent of any wrongdoing. As Marl tries to explain, the king says he knows that Krono and his friends were out saving the future. Don, the previous king of Guardia, and Kino all come out and thank the team. Luca appears from behind the throne and arrange the entire celebration. The king thanks everyone for saving the past, present, and future from destruction and tells Marl to enjoy the last night at the fair. When she gets there with Chrono, a moonlight parade commences. Melchior says there isn't much business in weapons anymore, but that he likes it that way. Chrono's mother is surprised that her son and his friends managed to save the world, but says Chrono should spend more time feeding his cat. Tobin enjoys the fair while drinking lemonade, and Lara is equally surprised. In the telepod area, Krono and his friends prepare to say their goodbyes and return to their own respective times. After telling everyone they were so strong, Isla pushes Kino into the portal to 65 million BC, then jumps in herself. Frog and King Guardia head back to the Middle Ages, and Marl kisses him on the cheek. Without saying a word, Magus heads to the portal, and Marl asks if he plans to search for Shala. Without saying a word, he jumps inside. As Robo prepares to leave, Luca begins to weep, realizing that the bleak future Robo was from may not exist in a world where Lavos is defeated. Robo thanks Luca for teaching him emotions, and Marl suggests Robo will be in the new, optimistic future. He then says goodbye and jumps inside. After their friends have left, Luca and Marl agree that the entity they believe was guiding the world's events is now at rest, content with a world without Lavos. As they discuss dismantling the Epoch, Chrono's mom chases Chrono's cat into the area. The cat jumps in the portal, and Chrono's mom mistakenly follows it inside, and the gate closes. After an initial panic, the party realizes they can track Chrono's mom down with the Epoch. Before they can leave, however, King Guardi of the Present brings Nadia's bell, named after his daughter, to adorn Lean Square. Before he can hang it up, Marl says she cannot be tied down and boards the Epoch to help her friends. Tobin arrives and shoots off fireworks into the sky. As the Epoch traverses time and soars through the air, it passes all the friends Chrono made on his journey. In 2300 AD, it streams by as Robo and Atropos XR overlook a cliff in a bright new future. In 65 million BC, it passes Isla and Kino as they ride Dactyl. In 600 AD, it passes Xenon Bridge as Frog, Queen Lean, and King Guardia look on. In 12,000 BC, it streaks through the sky as Magus hovers through the air. And that concludes my complete story explanation for Chrono Trigger. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel for more game storyline explanations, and click the bell to be alerted upon the release of new content. Also, please check out my other videos, and leave a comment below with your favorite aspect of Chrono Trigger.